Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. I'm Trey Thomas. I'm a program manager for the Chemicals, Nanotechnology, and Emerging Materials Program at the, Uni at the Consumer Product Safety Commission and co-chair of the Nanotechnology Environmental Health Implications Working Group, otherwise known as the NEHI. I will serve as your moderator for today's webinar, which is entitled, What We Know About Nano EHS, Building International Bridges. This webinar continues the NNI's Nano EHS webinar series, which is focused on sharing what we know about the environmental, health, and safety aspects of engineered nanomaterials. This webinar will feature experts from diverse disciplines to share their perspectives on key areas of the NNI's research strategy. The strategy incorporates a life cycle approach and outlines how health and safety research informs robust risk assessments and mitigation strategies. In addition to the U.S. strategy, the EU and other nations have developed documents that outline similar research priorities. Today, we look at the NNI's international collaborations and how building these bridges supported the broader EHS goals for the responsible development of nanotechnology. Before introducing our excellent panel of speakers, I wanna mention that the Nano EHS webinar series is an important platform for agencies participating in the National Nanotechnology Initiative, or NNI, to share information on Nano EHS research progress and findings. Throughout the series, experts will share the big take-home EHS messages with the broader nanotechnology community and highlight the NNI's role in answering these questions. We have set aside time for your questions to the panel today. You can type your uh, questions into the Q&A box, and we will try to get through as many questions as we can. I look forward to a lively conversation, and now I'll give a brief introduction uh, to the speakers. First, we have uh, Anil Patry. Anil is the Director of Nanotechnology Core Facility and chairs the Nanotechnology Task Force at the Food and Drug Administration. He serves on INSET and NEHI on behalf of the FDA and leads the International uh, Interest Group on Nanoplastics and is the U.S. co-chair of the U.S.-EU Characterization Communities of Research, or CORE. Prior to joining FDA, he served as the Deputy Director of the Nanotechnology Characterization Laboratory at NCI and was a guest uh, scientist at NIST. We also have with us Nora Savage. Uh, Nora is a director of the Nanoscale Interactions Program at the Chemical, Biological, Environmental, and Transport Systems, CBET, uh, division of the National Science Foundation's Engineering Directorate. An environmental engineer by training, uh, Dr. Savage was previously co-lead lead for EPA's Office of Research and Development's Nanotechnology Research Strategy and represents NSF on NS NSF subcommittee. And finally, uh, we have uh, Mark Wiesner. Uh, Dr. Wiesner is the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, and Director for the Center for the Environmental Implications of Nanotechnology. He is the U.S. Co-Chair of the Risk Assessment USEU Nano EHS Core, and also uh, Professor Wiesner is a Fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. So with this distinguished panel, we will start with a, a pre-recorded presentation uh, from Dr. Savage, uh, who unfortunately was unable to uh, join us uh, live today. So if we could pull up Dr. Savage's presentation. Hello, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Nora Savage, and I'll talk to you about international collaborations within the nano EHS community. As my outline, I'll talk a bit about how really international research has been a basis and a foundation from which this community has really thrived and has really moved forward in advancing the science. I'll talk about opportunities in the space and then talk about future horizon. So what are some important reasons for engaging in international research? 
Well, it helps agencies and organizations to innovate more sustainably, more robustly, and faster. It helps to strengthen the science that is supported. It results in really sustainable solutions to the wicked or challenging societal problems that we face. It helps provide um, and stimulate creativity. And finally, it helps to foster a convergent approach to meeting our challenges and to solving some of the emerging issues that we face. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the history within the nano EHS and how we've, as I said, it's been a basis for how the nano EHS community has really worked together. Um, I'm just gonna give some examples. The first are the Gordon Conferences. There are two, um, the one initiated in 2013, the Environmental Nano Gordon Conference, and another one on nano and agriculture, which was initiated in 2014. Both are vibrant, strong conferences still today. There's also been a lot of nano implications projects with which we have joined with the European Commission, both workshops, outreach conferences, as well as projects that we've sponsored. And I'll talk about the projects in a minute. And then finally, there are various NNCO activities, workshops and events, which also highlight and stimulate international research collaboration. So the net, the, the Aeronet SIN was one of those collaborations which the U.S. had with the U.S. Com European Commission. It stands, the Aeronet SIN is the European Research Area Network for Safe Implementation of Innovative Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. And this was a project that was, as I mentioned, sponsored by the European Commission, as well as several agencies, including the NSF, Consumer Product Safety Commission and NIEHS. 48 projects were submitted under this joint call and 10 projects were awarded. And of those, three are led by US researchers and we have um, five of those 10 projects involve US researchers. And the total amounts, dollar amounts that were expended in this collaborative venture are about 2 million US and about 4 million euros. Now, in, in an effort to try to engage continent to continent, um, there have been several workshops sponsored by my program. The first was is between um, the US and Africa. Um, we've had two conferences in this area. The first one took place in South Africa and it was August 11th through the 15th in 2019. And the theme of that conference was sustainable energy, water, and the environment. And the second conference was to take place this April in Cairo, Egypt, but due to the pandemic, it's gonna be virtual. So I encourage you to look for this conference. It's April 4th through the 8th, 2022. And it is on convergent approaches for sustainable energy, environment, and health. My program also sponsors a Pan American conferences, conference, and there have been two of these as well. Both have taken place in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The first was in November 27th through the 30th in 2017. And the second took place right before the pandemic, March 4th through the 7th. And both conferences focused on fundamental, for the fundamentals and the applications for really shaping how nanotechnology might help us meet future needs and goals and challenges. Now I'd like to talk about the NNI EH strategy, which also the 2011 EHS strategy, which also talks about the importance of engaging internationally. So if you look at the EHS, the 2011 EHS strategy document, I have the document on the side and I have the text contained here within this text box. And it really talks about how it makes a more inclusive, a more robust, a more scientifically strong research community by engaging internationally. And it help, helps us really fundamentally understand and move forward with nano applications to help society, to improve quality of life. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about what I call the yin and the yang. Um, so the yin is really where we are today and how we can 
maximize, optimize the things that we're doing today, the international collaborations we have, so that we get the best out of them. And the first is really to try to optimize current um, collaborations. How can we do that? Can we provide additional resources? Can we provide um, locations, logistics for these researchers to meet and to talk across, um, across about their projects and with other PIs who are collaborating internationally? How can we tune the current collaboration so that we get the best product output and we get things that will help us meet our um, societal goals and help us to maximize the benefits that are obtained from these? How can we begin to um, create the uh, uh, a best practices document from what we're doing now so that when we engage in future collaborations, we have a model, we have you know, ways of going forward that will help us make the best foot, put our best foot forward in doing these collaborations. And finally, and, and next, how can we nourish these existing collaborations? Can we provide more resources in terms of funds to help them do additional things, maybe supplemental funds to help engage more students or to engage in more outreach, or can we publicize the events that they're sponsoring? And then finally, we want to try to encourage these collaboration, these collaborators to think really holistically and, and outside of the box so that they can begin to think convergently and really help us to solve the societal problems. And what I call the yang is really the future. And the future really consists of understanding what um, the potential might be by thinking about some questions. And some of the questions could be, for example, where might the um, where might the horizon lie for where we could go? What, what is the, you know, the moon, if you will, for where we can reach in terms of these international collaborations? And how can collaborators, collaborations help us to address these um, complex emerging challenges that we face, these wicked problems that we face as a society? How might these um, critical obstacles that we face be overcome using these international collaborators in this nano HS space. What are the um, optim what, what are the ways that we can optimize future collaboration? So how can we really take what we've learned in the past and take these creative ideas that we have for the future, put them together and really put our, you know, move forward to reach the moon, to reach the stars, if you will. And then finally, how can we how can you know the technical areas that we have created within this space of international collaboration, how can those be broadened? What way should they be broadened or should they be narrowed? And how can we you know, optimize those to get the best research out of those collaborations? In terms of the yin and yang, the, the, the whole goal or, or the, the moon idea, of what I'm saying is that we know as we develop new technologies, there's always intended benefits or intended impacts, and they're unintended. These unintended impacts can be intentional, so those are the malicious ones, or they can be unintentional, such as lead in paint, such as the ozone hole that was created by Freon CFCs. So if we think about how to really engage international collaboration in a positive, best, the best way that we can, we can hopefully eliminate or at least minimize many of the adverse impacts, both those that are intentional and those that are non-intentional. And so that we really aim for just getting the benefits, whether, you know, mostly the ones that we intend, but then maybe we'll get some unintended benefits, but the benefits out of this new technology within the EHS space. That is our ultimate goal. So now I'd like to thank you for your attention. This is my contact information. You can contact me at any time by email, telephone. We are still remote working, so I'm always available by um, email mostly. But again, if you call, it also comes across through our emails, thanks to technology, just like I am able to provide this webinar to you as a pre-recording. Wish that I could be there with you. I know you'll have a great webinar and thank you for your attention. All right, that was a really great overview from uh, Dr. Savage. Uh, she provided us with a uh, number of ideas to think about in terms of uh, collaboration. Uh, what are some of the important uh, features uh, that we should consider uh, in, in terms of international 
uh, uh, research and, and collaborations. And so our next speaker uh, will be uh, Dr. Neil Petri from the FDA. And so Dr. Patrick, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anil Patri from Food and Drug Administration. NNI has been in the forefront in both domestic interagency interactions as well as international collaborations. I would like to talk about some of these international dialogues and collaborations that are impactful from my personal perspective, especially in international standards development. Uh, standards disclaimers apply to this presentation. The opinions are my own and uh, uh, not to be considered those of FDA. We learn about advances in nanotechnology and emerging issues at meetings and workshops where we engage in scientific dialogue. This knowledge results in development of guidance and policies from regulatory agencies. Such a dialogue also enables standards development where stakeholders from across the globe develop robust standards through consensus. Standards recognition by regulatory bodies enables uh, high quality product development and commercialization. In this context, I would like to provide examples of international engagement with significant impact in uh, recent years. The first example is a global coalition for regulatory science research, which meets every year and conducts global summits on topics of interest to regulatory agencies from 10 countries and the European Union. The Nanotechnology Working Group of GCRSR organized the summits in 2016 to identify the standards needs, uh, those that are critical for regulatory agencies, uh, followed by another meeting in 2019 in Italy on nanotechnology, an emerging topic of nanoplastics. These meetings consolidate opinions across global regulators and result in collaborative work, standards development, and harmonization. Similarly, the International Pharmaceutical Regulators Program of the IPRP, Nanomedicines Working Group, has membership from 16 regulatory agencies from across the globe and shares data, regulatory collaboration, and capacity building in nanotechnology. The EU-US communities of research that engages in active, active discussions on EHS and encourages joint program to leverage resources, not a, a, a highlighted some of those from NSF. The characterization communities of research discuss emerging challenges in characterization of nanomaterial, standards development, and uh, also uh, recent issues with micro nanoplastics. Uh, these meetings happen once uh, every year in US or in Europe. Uh, I guess the next one is uh, scheduled in August. So these meetings, international meetings, um, enable dialogue among the international experts and learn from each other's experience. Coming to standards, um, standards development requires international consensus from subject matter experts and stakeholders. And standards mean different things to different people. Reference material that national metrology institutes develop enable documentary standards development. Standards development organizations such as ISO TC229, ASTM, International E56 Committee on Nanotechnology, developed dozens of international standards over the past decade. Individual country delegations also discuss the need for standards and harmonization at OECD Working Party on Manufactured Nanomaterial, WPMN. Uh, on the left, you see the examples of gold reference material standards that are developed by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, similar such standards on silica and other material that uh, help with the measurements were also developed by Joint Research Center and uh, NMI in Australia and NRC from Canada. So, uh, so what happens to these standards after they are developed? One significant impact is through regulatory agencies such as FDA recognizing pertinent standards that industry can utilize. 
FDA recognized 20 standards in nanotechnology over the years and updates these periodically. Uh, here is an example on the right of all those 20 standards. And you can access these from the uh, web link below. Uh, they, such recognized standards uh, increase predict predictability, streamline pre-market approval, and facilitate market entry. They have significant impact to support public health. Another example of such international engagement that was facilitated through the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office is the Indo-US Science and Technology Forum sponsored regulatory science workshop. These meetings composed of US delegates and Indian delegates from government agencies and academia to discuss science um, and resulted in capacity building workshops in India. A significant outcome from these discussions is the development of guidelines for evaluation of nanopharmaceuticals in India in 2019. You know, such guidances and harmonization help us uh, agencies such as FDA and others across the globe. And finally, uh, the emerging topic of micro nanoplastics in marine debris. Under NNI, we formed an interagency interest group on nanoplastics, which is composed of around 100 members from more than 20 different agencies. Discussions at these meetings uh, and USCU meetings resulted in a proposal to the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation's Oceans and Fisheries Working Group. And a workshop was held in December with many EPIC econ economies participate, uh, participating at, at this meeting or workshop. Uh, this is going to result in a workshop report, and then we hope that this will result in international collaboration on this emerging topic of interest. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pantry. That was uh, uh, very informative uh, and very interesting. I think we'll, and uh, I encourage the audience as you hear these presentations, please think of questions uh, for our speakers. And so for our final uh, speaker today uh, is Dr. Mark Wiesner uh, from Duke University. And so Dr. Wiesner, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Trey. Well, as Nora had pointed out in, in her presentation, uh, the international dimensions uh, of the nano EHS community have really been there from the start. And um, uh, I'm gonna, we, when we were preparing for this, we, we just, there was just so much stuff that we could have talked about. I'm gonna really focus here on uh, some of the collaborations that I've been uh, most directly involved in. And the very first, uh, this was actually the first ever uh, uh, international meeting on nanotechnology and environment. Uh, it was when I was at Rice University and I was uh, directing the Energy and Environmental Systems Institute and with some funding from the French Embassy, uh, we brought people together to, um, uh, to talk about both the benefits and perils. The benefits kind of represented here by Tinkerbell and that slide, I had to dig out this slide from, from the, uh, the depths of my computer and then Darth Vader for the, uh, the perils. And, but uh, these, these themes have, have stuck with us. So we had a lot of star power at this initial meeting. We had uh, uh, Rick Smalley, who of course was, was present in the Oval Office when uh, George Bush signed the, the, uh, the, the National Nanotechnology uh, Initiative. Uh, we had Neil Lane, former NSF, head of NSF and uh, uh, science advisor to, uh, to Bill Clinton. Uh, he also spoke at this event and then of course, all of our colleagues, primarily this was uh, co-organized with um, uh, Jean-Yves Bateau and, and Jean Mose from uh, uh, the CEREG in uh, uh, the Geosciences Environment Lab uh, in the, the south of uh, Aix-en-Provence. And uh, so, yeah, we, we got together and we talked about uh, really all of these uh, notions about how nano could be used for, for uh, all sorts of environmental technologies, such as water treatment and then the potential impacts of these. That uh, effort went on, actually, there were a few follow-up meetings to that, uh, co-financed by NSF and, uh, and the French Embassy. Um, and then uh, we had the, uh, the US uh, uh, EU uh, uh, nano EHS meetings that uh, the communities of research, that the number of those communities grew over time. Uh, that certainly reinforced uh, many of the uh, the efforts that were growing uh, and had already been actually put in place at that time to some extent. Uh, but 
the, the beauty of these meetings was the fact that when we would get together at other conferences, uh, of course, it was always a time to, to meet in the hallways and talk and uh, uh, think about, uh, you know, hear what other people were doing and think about how to do research. But the, the, the communities of research meetings were really focused on how does one collaborate and where are the, uh, the advantages uh, that, that might be gained from international collaboration and uh, where are the gaps that need to be filled. Um, sometime before that started, a couple of years before, in 2008, uh, uh, the Center for the Environmental Applications and Nanotechnology was formed. Um, uh, this was with uh, financing from uh, NSF and initially from EPA. Uh, and that, in its conception, was itself a, an international uh, entity. Uh, this is just a, a, a graphic that we would use uh, initially that showed some of the international partners involved. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, collection of partners really grew over time, but it certainly included uh, many of our uh, colleagues uh, in, in Europe, but also colleagues uh, in China uh, and uh, even in Australia. So, um, yes, international dimensions of this work have certainly uh, gone on for quite some time. The, uh, in the context of SAINT, some of the things we're working with, with our international collaborators, uh, uh, this is just a very high-level summary of, of some of the, the, the key things uh, that, uh, that we accomplished uh, uh, over a period of about 13 years, was uh, demonstrating the, the importance of transformations in, uh, in the surface chemistry of nanomaterials, in nanomaterial exposure and effects, uh, introducing the notion of functional assays. Of course, the, the initial notion was that, I think as we formulated this research, was that we were going to map nanoparticle properties all the way into risk. And that is still, of course, the holy grail, and there are still efforts uh, that are structured around that. Um, but uh, we introduced this notion of functional assays, which says, well, let's measure things in, in uh, either reference or, um, you know, uh, com complex environments that allow us to parameterize uh, quantitative models that will allow us to then uh, predict exposure and hazard. Uh, there is a whole number of uh, 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 papers that came out showing the, the relative exposures of nanomaterials, not only from engineered sources, but bringing into the, the conversation the notion of natural and uh, incidental nanomaterials, uh, which have much higher levels of, of, of uh, sources and exposures. And then there's many, many bullet points that we could put under this here in terms of nanospecific effects on organisms and ecosystems uh, that go from uh, uh, shifts in ecosystem productivity to um, uh, uh, maternal transfer to bio concentration in organisms and, and transfer through, uh, through food chains. Um, again, consistent with the 2011 um, uh, document that uh, uh, both Trey and, and uh, Nora mentioned, uh, there was a, an important focus from the very beginning on uh, risk forecasting methods and uh, then ultimately the, the uh, creation of a, a platform for uh, data and a, a sort of an architecture or an approach to uh, cataloging data uh, in the form of the Nanoinformatics Knowledge Commons or the NIC, uh, bringing in all sorts of partners, which I'll get back to um, in just a moment. But the idea was is that this, the, the NIC would bring together notions of functional assays, fundamental characterization, all sorts of exposure and hazard uh, endpoints, and then all the metadata associated with uh, those studies. A key um, element of that, which even if the NIC is not being used by others, I think uh, the, the notion that um, uh, we've been able to uh, get out in our international uh, uh, community, as, as we've all worked together on this, is the, the idea of an instance map, that we can uh, store data in a way that allows us to follow um, uh, nanomaterials uh, over time uh, and uh, characterize uh, at once the, the changes in the nanomaterials themselves, but also uh, having uh, indicators of what the, the media are that uh, these uh, uh, nanomaterials might be passing through. Um, and that has really brought us together uh, uh, with a, a wide range of partners. Again, uh, Serenade at, uh, at the Serej, uh, always in there, Nanophase, uh, and uh, uh, colleagues at the, uh, the UK Center for uh, uh, Environmental uh, Hydrology, 
the uh, uh, Isolde Lynch and uh, uh, all sorts of uh, things having to do with nanocommons and, and so on and so on. So um, uh, this is very much, I mean, the, the creation or the emergence of these, these data platforms, the NIC being one, has very much been uh, a, a product of international collaboration. Um, we had some support from uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, Commission and then uh, through the Army, uh, looking at the notion of release of nanomaterials from uh, composites and um, the, uh, what we call a matrix release factor without getting into all the details of this. Uh, again, this builds on uh, some of the, uh, the data that was uh, um, curated into uh, the NIC and involved Ultimately, I think some of the ideas of this matrix release factor have again moved into the international community. One place where that's true is there's uh, now as we move into, into new topics uh, is uh, the idea of uh, looking at nanoplastics, microplastics, nanoplastics, and this is just one uh, uh, project that was funded by CEFIC, which is uh, the, the, the uh, uh, European Chemical Industry Foundation. Uh, and it's a collaboration between our colleagues in, in, in Germany, uh, here at Duke, uh, Amsterdam, and the UK. Um, and it's actually one of a constellation of uh, four and ultimately six, because there's two projects that have to do with, the, um, with the, the toxicity of the nanomaterials. These are looking more at the, the exposure side and modeling that. But these is, this is, uh, by its, in its conception, it is very much an international uh, effort and uh, so as we move into new topics. Draws on methods uh, from King Science to perform assessments on five materials related challenges. Part of uh oh, I've system got system a, a slide here with some, some uh, animation on it. Used in transportation, so I don't know how to stop it, but treatment. maybe I'll just let it talk here. Bioparticles and consequences of micro and nanoplastics. This work will be facilitated by shared resources that include spectroscopy and imaging facilities, mesocosm and ecotoxicity analysis, Informatics platforms for novel materials, and finally, modern Mark is kind of phasing in and out. Uh, okay, well, I'll just talk over it then. But the point is, is that we have a new international collaboration funded by NSF that deals with the issue of uh, how do we create uh, networks of networks, uh, bringing partners together from both Europe uh, and uh, the United States, and, uh, and looking at applications in agriculture, micro nanoplastics, transportation infrastructure, and uh, uh, particles that have some uh, a biological uh, uh, fingerprint. And uh, the focus here is really on novel materials. And that brings together a whole uh, group of people that, uh, again, is a vast network of people involved in this. So I apologize for that uh, 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 animation with the, the voice on it, but um, hopefully that will trigger some, some conversation. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you uh, both. Uh, well, first, thank you, Mark, for that that uh, really thorough presentation on, on on the work that you've done and the collaborations. And uh, hopefully, this will uh, spur some questions. So, I encourage our audience to please uh, submit questions uh, to our panelists. Uh, and I will go ahead and start. Um, again, you you mentioned. Uh, both of you in your presentations, the US-EU cores, uh, communities of research. And I wonder if you wanted to talk more about what this uh, collaborative effort is. Uh, and and, uh, and I may ask some more specific questions. But first, just your talk a little bit more about what the US-EU uh, communities of research, what it is and, and your experience, just general experiences. Uh, well, the deal, I, you want to, uh, Mark, you want to start? I can start. <laughs> Let Mark, yeah, Mark, yeah. Thank okay. You. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's first and foremost, it's a forum uh, for meeting and thinking about how one can actually collaborate by leveraging off of existing efforts. That would be my description of it. Um, there is, of course, uh, with, within um, uh, that effort. Uh, there's not direct investment in research, but it, it gives you really the essential uh, edge uh, or additional feature of bringing people together so that they can take the work they're doing and, um, uh, and see how it can be coordinated. Um, we've uh, used this, I, I think, uh, to, to great advantage, again, in areas like um, uh, data platforms, 
uh, in protocol developments and in um, uh, looking at approaches uh, both to, to risk analysis and risk management. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Emil? Yeah, I'm uh, especially involved in the characterization communities of research. And as you know, these uh, meetings happen once in US and the uh, alternately in, in Europe. Um, and then this is where we also developed a network uh, of experts and scientists. And so um, from a characterization standpoint, the challenges are common, whether you are here in, in Europe or in Asia. And so we, we um, uh, came up with uh, methods and methodologies. Somewhat, sometimes we discuss the standards, the challenges when you conduct interlab studies, and we shared that knowledge, especially for biological uh, interlab studies, um, and uh, the emerging topics of interest from a characterization standpoint that includes the micro nanoplastics. Uh, and, and so um, we also talked about a new nanomedicine communities of research. This is under development. Um, I, I know there is a nano manufacturing communities of research under development. Uh, and these are these uh, kind of uh, communities enable dialogue and learn from each other, uh, each other's experience and very beneficial. Great. Uh, and, and just to follow up, I think with these, you're, you're both in very different disciplines. Anil, you're in the characterization and nanomedicine. Mark, you're more in the environmental and done a lot of database. Can you touch on perhaps some of the unique challenges? Because the, the strategy covers a number of different areas, everything from human health to environmental, uh, and we've been, and even included nanomedicines. Uh, so can you talk about perhaps the differences and, and some of the unique challenges in these uh, various disciplines you've seen in, in these global initiatives? Anil, your turn to go first. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so one area for the nanomedicine um, side of the story is that these are medical products, uh, mostly the platforms are themselves safe. Um, you know, therapeutic, uh, that you are using uh, can have uh, either cytotoxicity or, or toxicity, but the material for most part that is used to deliver these uh, drugs and therapeutics are safe. So, um, you know, there is a lot of knowledge on these uh, polymers, liposomes, uh, emulsions, uh, but there are quite too many challenges when you bring complex products, multifunctional products, and we communicate across. But at the same time, when you go to a uh, let's say a toxicology meeting uh, where the focus is probably on carbon nanotubes or metals, metal oxides, rather than the platforms that are used uh, for medical products area. So there is a, some confusion that exists, but overall, uh, over the years, we learned quite a bit in the last 15 years or so, and uh, very effectively brought uh, many of these products, uh, the companies brought many of these products to the market. Mark. Great. And I think the support of commercialization is, is always important. Uh, Mark? Yeah, so a couple things come to mind in, in terms of challenges. Uh, one is just the, the uh, 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 political and economic systems that we're embedded in and what that, uh, how that affects us as we come together uh, meeting about this. And so, um, you know, the, the, the idea, of, as I like to say, of uh, no data, no market versus uh, no data no regulation. I mean, that really is a, it, it flavors the, um, the kind of research that is done and the goals of the research. And I think it's actually been a, uh, a plus rather than a challenge. Uh, it, um, it, it, it takes, one, one has to change one's perspective a little bit looking uh, at uh, the way the research is done, but I think it actually uh, adds a, a very useful dimension on, on uh, uh, both in, to, to both parties in, in thinking about the, uh, uh, the research that we're doing. The other thing is, and this goes really uh, far beyond um, the international dimensions of, of different uh, countries and languages and so on come together, but also just disciplines. Um, and I, it's really evident as, as you go from, say, environmental to medicine, 
the things that the words that we use to call things. Okay, so the ontology mm -hmm. of um, uh, of of this this discipline is quite important, and that's becoming now embedded in the uh, uh, the data platforms uh, that are being built. There's just a tremendous amount of of thought being given to to what we call things so that data are shareable uh, and uh, uh, and findable. Well, let me follow up, Mark, with that question, because I think ontology, uh, and I'm remembering the early years of just defining nano, how is that progressing? And, if you, and uh, so broadly, uh, are, are we able to come to some consensus, uh, you know, for these various materials? And uh yeah your thoughts on on that more specifically yeah well i hope we're coming to some consensus um i, I think i think we are making a progress there because the, the these conversations are occurring and there are actual um ontologies that are being built that we're we're agreeing on so um the um you know a related thing there's actually I had a question in the chat here um about um the the, the notion of an instance map and and what that is uh, the, the question is what's what's an instance and it's basically a place and a time uh and at that place and time are <clears throat> defined by i mean it could be in the gut of a fish or it could be in the, the place could be the gut of a fish or it could be out in the the ocean or it could be within the bloodstream of a human uh, or a lab rat, um, uh, and then that's being uh, tracked over time. So the, the, the way that data are structured so that they're, they're referenced by uh, the description of place, the medium, and then the description of the material that we're tracking, uh, that really is what goes into defining an instance. And I think that, that notion, even as I was saying, even if the NIC has not been adopted, I think that notion uh, has made its way uh, into, um, it, it's gone beyond the initial uh, uh, international collaboration that we've uh, uh, been involved into others who are thinking about how to, to structure their data. Okay, great. Anil, did you want to have yes. anything to weigh in on that uh, question? Yeah, I'd like to comment on the, uh, um, on the terminology uh, and, and uh, definitions. So early on, uh, I guess I remember uh, early some 15 years ago, uh, there was a, a quite a discussion about what is considered as nanomaterial, nanomaterial definition. So if you go to a, an ISO meeting or an OECD or ASTM meetings, mm -hmm. uh, most of the discussions uh, were uh, focused around the size dimensions, one to 100 nanometers. And, uh, what okay. if it is 105 nanometers, you know, 110 nanometers, but it depends on what the years we learned that depending on how you measure these material, whether you use electron microscopy or, or some other solution phase measurement, the same material can, can, can give you a different result. Uh, and uh, so that kind of dialogue uh, is uh, not at the forefront these days because we know how to, we understand how to regulate these um, and you know we um, we allowed for um, regulators from across the globe to have their own definitions right so European definitions are different if you go to Asia it's different uh, at FDA we have a consideration we don't have a formal definition so one to 100 nanometers in size dimensions but even if if the materials are beyond 100 nanometers up to a micron, uh, they can have unique properties that enable novel applications. And so we have those uh, uh, those considerations given to uh, these emerging material. And so those discussions kind of died down, but then uh, the discussions were around um, uh, databases. You know, how, how do you uh, get the data? And then uh, even with the emerging micro nanoplastics, that's a uh, a discussion we are having across the globe as to we generate the data, how can we uh, get all these data sets together, all the uh, databases to talk to each other and have curated data. Uh, and, and this is going to be useful across uh, across the board, whether you're a scientist or a, or a regulator. Yeah, and if I could yeah, just follow you. up on that, I, I think these, these notions of definition and, and so on are 
probably have never been more important than they are right now because these products are out in the marketplace they're everywhere and we're only now at the point where um, some of these are materials or the products themselves are being regulated and that in order for things to function efficiently i mean there needs to be uh, not only regulatory agreement, but that's going to be built, I think, on scientific um, consensus to some degree. And, um, and so the, 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 the international dialogue of, of uh, you know, what is an animaterial, um, how do we characterize an animaterial, how do we characterize release of nanomaterials from products, and so on, these, are, these I think, are going to be more important than ever. Absolutely. We have a question, and this may be in the chat. Um, some of you are, are directly involved in occupational exposure limits, but the question is how far along is the international community on developing occupational exposure limits? Uh, either of you want to try tackle that, uh, that question? Trey, you should tackle that question from CPSC standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and and uh, yeah, it's it's um, we uh, this may be a topic for further you know uh, discussion on on the uh, develop occupation exposure limits. Uh, there certainly are efforts you know to for that. Well, uh, let me ask you, Anil, you, you you in terms of the voluntary standards, are there any voluntary standards activities that you're aware of that you know may assist? Perhaps are not uh, directly involved with, with with occupational, but just exposure limits in general. Or Mark, you know, are you aware of perhaps data that's being generated that in general could support uh, exposure limits? Yeah, I don't know about uh, those. NIOSH has certainly has documents that uh, one could check on their website about the occupational exposure for engineered nanomaterial, uh, but, but uh, I can't really comment on the, on the international standards in that space. Okay, thanks. Uh, are the next question uh, from the audience, and, and this I think is uh, more for Nora, uh, you know, if there are any plans for joint calls, but uh, the, uh, the air net approach is relatively small pots of funding from, from both sides. Uh, in terms of collaboration and output, uh, could there, and, and this may be relevant, could the CORE's uh, meeting in, in the, this year, 2022, brainstorm on potential topics for joint funding? So, uh, Art, if you want to touch on that, again, not being from research, necessarily research agencies, but just the ideas of, of coming together to uh, develop topics uh, for research. Yeah, I, I think Esalt makes a really great point there. I mean, and, and now, as she's very much aware, now is the time uh, when the, the agenda for the the uh, that meeting is is being put together. So, uh, 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 duly noted. I, I think that's uh, that would be a really good thing to work on. The question is: Is will there be decision makers there that uh, can influence the the funding uh, afterwards? Yeah, and, and then. We'll yeah, and then another challenge uh, we um, we found is that the cycles from EU and US are different, and so for it's it's it was uh, challenging in the past to uh, have joint calls, even though there were some successes, uh, some examples of that happening from NSF. Um, and uh, sorry, Nora is not here, but they participated in the US EU meeting. Uh, back five years ago to, to discuss the same topics, you know, that to have joint funding where EU side is going to fund the EU scientists and the US side is going to fund the US collaborators. And uh, I hope that can happen again. All right, thank you all. Now here's an interesting question. Uh, how are private sector, how's the private sector involved in assessing environmental risks associated with nanoscale materials and how often are their findings made available to the public? Uh, and additionally, how involved are private sector in these conversations on data sharing? 
So I, I think it's an interesting question, uh, Mark, you coming from uh, the ac- uh, academic side uh, and perhaps even Anil from, from, from your uh, of regulatory research. Uh, and Mark, maybe perhaps we can start with you. Uh, your interactions with the private sector uh, in, in terms of research and, and their contributions, yeah, how do they fit within this equation? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's um, a critical question. The uh, the kinds of data that we're talking about, I would suggest, are a public good, and um, we all know, um, you know, the tragedy of commons, how public goods work out. Um, it's very difficult to uh, both uh, properly uh, allocate resources to the development of data like that, okay, if it's going to come from the private sector, because there's no incentive for individual companies to uh, uh, to go beyond the minimum. And there's there's even less incentive, perhaps, for them to, to share data uh, uh, if there's uh, particularly if it begins to, to move into proprietary uh, uh, territory. So um, I presume that many companies are doing this. I think this is always been the case. Some of the earlier uh, discussions that I had back in, in uh, 2000, 2001 with uh, some companies that will remain unnamed, um, uh, that it was clear that they had done some testing. I think that's got to go on. But again, the, the real responsibility for uh, getting these data out there are, is, is, is either got to come from, a, I would suggest, a a regulatory hammer, which requires the, the, the production of the data, or a, uh, a uh, governmental investment in uh, producing third-party um, uh, data that everyone can, can trust. Okay, great, thank you. Adil, do you wanna touch yeah, on that? Yeah, so this is mainly the EPA territory, I should say, and most of the engineered nanomaterial used in medical products, uh, we obviously engage with industry. Uh, industry comes with a submission and we review. But from an environmental standpoint, the one um, recent uh, meeting that I was talking about, the APEC uh, micro, uh, the nanoplastics uh, workshop we had uh, just two months ago, um, we had industry participation. The American Chemistry Council, for example, developed uh, standards in collaboration with uh, the Hawaii Pacific University to provide uh, close to 25 or so or 30 uh, different polymer standards, uh, micro and nano um, kind of size dimensions, not specific uh, nanoplastics or microplastics. These are pristine polymers that can be used as a starting point to uh, understand the micro nanoplastics from the environment and, and in oceans. So this is a, I should say, um, we should engage with industry uh, as much as possible. And uh, also they are collaborating to bring these uh, reference material um, where they are appropriate. So I think this is going to be a beneficial interaction. Yeah, and the, the separate uh, uh, funding of uh, work on the micro nanoplastics is another great example of that. Absolutely. Now we have further questions on the, on the nanoplastics. I just wanted to point out uh, that there were uh, funding calls uh, from the European Commission, which uh, explicitly encouraged collaboration with the U.S. Uh, nanotechnology researchers. Uh, this is on the U.S. EU core page, uh, but these were closed at the end of the last EU cycle. And for those that are not familiar, there is a U.S. Uh, EU core website uh, and uh, encourage those uh, folks who are attending. Uh, to go to that site uh, for more information regarding those solicitations. So uh, our next question, uh, let's see, that's been answered. So one question I have, we, we talked about the US-EU core uh, and uh, what other areas, Nora did touch on some of the other areas of the globe. Uh, Anil, I know that you've been involved in some other collaborative efforts uh, with other uh, parts of the of the globe. Do you want to touch on that and just uh, how different again were those experiences from your participation and the in the US EU core? And Mark, I'll give you an opportunity to to answer that question as well. 
I would let uh, Mark go first about specifically about USCU. Uh, I think one area that we made a difference is standards. Uh, I, I presented those uh, and they require expertise and sometimes uh, we have expertise, but they don't necessarily participate in standards development. Uh, and, and so we bring stakeholders from wherever they are um, and with expertise on a specific test method or a guide and then you know collaborate with them. Uh, let's say ISO has a lot of members from Asia, from Japan, from China, uh, from Korea. Um, and then so when we go to these ISO uh, meetings, uh, this is where we learn about the efforts and, and their individual, their countries, they have their own uh, standards development bodies. And then uh, China developed a lot of these standards in Chinese in their own country. So we are trying to develop, uh, bring some of those mm -hmm. as well to, to these international bodies. Mark. Yeah, the, the, the collaborations with other parts of the world is certainly been extensive and China really stands out. Uh, they, they brought a lot of resources to the table. So um, both in bringing or in proposing to bring um, researchers into China to, to look at what they're doing and describe what, what kind of work uh, uh, is, is happening uh, in their home, lab, home labs, but um, uh, then also in financing students uh, uh, to, to come uh, uh, to, to the United States and to Europe to, to work in labs uh, and on, on topics of mutual interest. And that's, that's quite widespread. I think um, almost everyone in academia can, can sort of relate to uh, those sorts of uh, collaborations. Um, the, um, we did have a, uh, uh, a small supplement in Saint um, uh, to do some collaborations uh, with uh, Ghana, uh, and uh, unfortunately that hit right when uh, when COVID broke out. So that uh, did not um, it was not as productive as we would have liked. Um, and we have uh, worked a great deal. I mean, on the characterization side, uh, Brazil particularly comes to mind with the synchrotron faci facilities and so on. Uh, uh, that uh, Australia as well. Uh, so the, these are very expensive and um, limited resources that uh, from an international standpoint make a, a great deal of sense to, uh, uh, to, to, to collaborate on. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to touch on, uh, there was a question regarding voluntary standards. You, you, you've, uh, and Neil in particular, you talk about voluntary standards in uh, both the reference standards and the documentary uh, standards. Can you talk a little bit about the internet more about, uh, and, and provide us a little bit more insight on this standards process, some of the meetings that you've had that, that address uh, voluntary standards and just what are some of the benefits and challenges on, on an international level of, of standards development? Um, I hope I can capture that in a minute or two. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> so the reference material development takes a long time. Uh, again, the, our interactions with the NIST are very beneficial because in US, only the uh, metrology uh, institutes such as NIST can develop those reference material standards. Uh, there are standard reference material, reference material, and there are test material. Uh, there are also certified res reference material, uh, different terminology, but it, 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 it takes uh, many years to develop one standard, one reference material standard. It's not easy. Um, and and they, at the end of the day, they have to, be, have, to have a, a certified value. They have to be useful. Um, and and uh, for researchers and for an intended purpose. And so once you develop those reference material standards, they can be used, for example, in measurements. So the goal reference material standards can be used as uh, in measurements and interlab studies. We take the same material, send it to 20 labs, and we have done those. Uh, and uh, so what kind of data do you get if you do TEM, dynamic scattering or some other measurements? And, and so that is where you get uh, precision and bias in your measurement, which is very useful, only dispersity analysis. Uh, when it comes to the reference, uh, beyond the reference material, the 
documentary standards also take many years. Each standard sometimes may take seven, eight, nine years. If you go to ISO, uh, one of the first standards took so many years to develop. And, and so there is a reason behind that because you need to bring experts uh, and develop consensus. And consensus building is not easy. Uh, scientists don't necessarily agree on, on uh, technical grounds or some other grounds. Um, so they, they do take time and it takes a lot of effort. And the positive side is through the dialogue and consensus. Uh, so far now we have so many standards. Early on there were not too many, but now uh, we have dozens of standards at ISO and ASTM uh, that for example, have a significant impact that industry can use uh, for example, if they if they measure using a dynamic light scattering that is a standard developed by uh, Vince Hackley from NIST, for example, uh, they can utilize the standard, make their measurements, let's say, uh, for their liposome and provide the data to regulatory agencies such as FDA. And, and it, the dialogue, uh, the, the uh, iterative process that happens, it becomes much shorter, much easier. And, and it's very smooth and uh, much, much faster in some cases. So it, it helps industry, it helps regulators, um, but it is very important to identify appropriate standards uh, that are used. And, and so that's where these consensus building, these meetings come in. And then I'm glad to see significant progress from this global summit that identified the standards. There were many, many meetings that that happened in the last 15 years on what standards do we need? And then who takes up those standards? Uh, I can come up with a hundred different standards that we need, but then each of them, the development timeline is, is significant and, and a lot of effort. One area that, that the funding agency should consider, in my opinion, is to fund for standards development. And we have not been doing that here in US to the extent we should be doing. And, and in the EU, there, there are some, uh, there is some funding towards that. So I hope that there is more um, funding in that area so that uh, whoever is interested in developing the standards uh, uh, get the resources they need. All right, thank you. Uh, that, was, that was very informative. Mark, from your perspective, any insight academics uh, the research, the impact of the, the standards, your use of them, and again, from a global perspective. Well, I can't add too much uh, beyond what Anil uh, said. I, the, it's very useful to have standards, of course. Uh, the, I would maybe open the discussion a bit more beyond the material standards to include protocols for how one evaluates right. particular parameters. So that's quite important. And we're really seeing this, for example, now with, uh, with the micro nanoplastics, um, uh, you know, how does one, um, how does one generate, for example, uh, a, a microplastic uh, for use? Uh, uh, how does one do aging? These are all that we've, we've learned so much, you know, in, um, with our experience in, um, in nano and how one, would do aging studies, what are critical parameters uh, to measure for uh, looking at surface interactions and you know, the affinity of particles for, 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 for tissues, for soils, uh, uh, that, yeah, I, I think you know, some of these have been through uh, OECD, through ISO, et cetera. These have been um, um, uh, written down and, uh, uh, and adopted by by researchers across uh, across the globe. So, and I think that's an important point that you see and to emphasize the fact that these standards for protocols, laboratory research protocols, that they do have an impact on the robustness of the data. And I think as we we talk about the strategy, we use the data looking at it from a regulatory perspective. We rely upon these data and stakeholders in general. For, for decision making so that these standards, you know, play a role in the robustness of, of the data that are using for these decisions. And I think that there is a global, should we say, uh, level, a, a, a level, uh, a consistent level of, of data quality 
across the globe. So just to follow up, Mark, and, and even Anil, if you could just touch on that, because I think that's such a critical point on, you know, that, that link between the standards, having these standard protocols, and again, the robustness of the data. Yeah, I mean, there's not a, um, uh, I mean, I, I see it in, in really in, in, in two ways. One, there's not a, a journal out there that uh, publishes uh, nano or materials related uh, uh, data that the question doesn't come up, you know, what, uh, what is adequate in terms of materials characterization, for example. And uh, um, that, even after all these years, I would say is not entirely resolved, but there's certainly, uh, the bar has been moved up um, uh, considerably. Uh, we, most people expect, for example, with nanomaterials that you have to have a, uh, some, some basic characterization of, of composition, of size, of distribution, uh, and, and probably, and certainly in the, uh, not probably, but certainly in the media that these things were produced. So, uh, per reporting a zeta potential uh, in uh, deionized water might be interesting, but you need to be able to compare that to one that might be done in a uh, growth medium or in plasma. The other one that obviously comes in is then in data sharing so that, and you alluded to this, Trey, uh, um, you know, if you're going to share data, then you're looking at the quality of the data. And so this, this comes back to um, how does one curate data into the platforms that we've used? What, what, where do we set the bar for that curation? And then how do we, if you want to, if you want to have different degrees of data quality, how does one uh, indicate that within the platform? And Neil, I'll give you a chance to touch on that, and perhaps Mark, we can come back to that idea of, uh, of database and data quality. But Anil, from from the your agency's perspective, research and regulatory. Do you want to touch on that question? Yeah, from a, a data quality perspective, again, standards, uh, when you develop, if there is a test method, I mean, there are different different kinds of standards, right? So there are guides, uh, there are test methods. So what we have seen is that for material properties, analytical uh, assays are more robust when you conduct interlab studies. But if you take an in vitro assay, uh, that uh, poses significant challenge from interlab study standpoint. Case in point, uh, we developed these, uh, you know, we conducted interlab studies from the gold reference material work uh, from NIST, the 10, 30, 60 nanometers colloidal gold. And we could uh, develop robust um, data set for reproducibility, uh, precision, and bias in the measurement across 20 different labs. Uh, from TEM, dynamic light scattering, uh, zeta potential, and, and other, uh, other tests. But when we did the same with uh, cytotoxicity and hemolysis in vitro assays, uh, you know, we, we couldn't develop that same level of precision in the measurements. Um, that is inherent to in vitro assays. Uh, there are many challenges conduct conducting those uh, biological assays, even if you take the same material and send the material across to 10 different labs. Uh, and, and so following to that, there, there were efforts in Europe taking the lessons learned from US effort uh, and, and to replicate the same. Uh, again, you know, you start with two labs and then see uh, if you take the same material, same number of cells and then run a cytotoxicity or cell viability assay. Uh, what data set do you get versus then you, you know, compare it to, to 10 different labs and, and that variability is, is more significant. And so uh, what I feel is uh, sometimes these are guides uh, are more useful in that area and then very appropriate test methods are at a higher bar uh, because they have to have precision and bias in the measurements. And, and so for in vitro assays that we really need by a compatibility assessment um, you know, that's where we need to have more guides and, uh, and, and standards in that space. Yes, thank you. Uh, excellent answer. Mark, I want to go back. You, you, you were touching on the database, and, and we had actually a webinar on databases and informatics. But from your perspective, uh, from a global perspective, do you want to touch on uh, just some of the 
I would say uh, where we've, we've made progress and some of the achievements in the database and, and just their experiences on an international level, developing and, and the, the relationship between, we talked about robust research, uh, data curation and these databases. Yeah, well, I think, um, first of all, the one, one huge bit of progress is that um, we're often dealing with scientific communities um, uh, such as my own that, uh, you know, we were not brought up in uh, the, the, the basics of uh, data science. Uh, one of the, the cases I'm making now just here at Duke, and I think many other people are making the case, is that this should be a part of uh, it's as important to, to know data science, uh, elements of data science, as it is elements of aquatic chemistry, for example. Um, but bringing that expertise into the field and bringing it to bear, that I, I think was an important, um, uh, an important uh, barrier to overcome. Probably less so on the toxicity side because there, um, there has been uh, a long history of, of data science on, on the tox side. But on the exposure uh, assessment side, that, that was not quite as, uh, uh, so prevalent. And the, um, the international aspects of uh, how we've come together, not only in being able to, 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 to bring the expertise in, but then agree on um, uh, just what the elements should be within the database. That was not necessarily a given at the outset either. Just what kind of information should go into these databases. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's really like protocols. I think it's really important to note that um, you, you know you, you, we probably don't want as a um, uh, as an objective to have one. Uh, universally accepted and required uh, protocol for evaluating everything. Uh, these we, there needs to be some level of flexibility that's going to be um, uh, uh, adapted to each community and to each the, the specificity of uh, of, of each uh, each need. And the uh, the same is true for databases. You the idea that there might be one database that we uh, universally all use. I, that's never going to happen, um, and it probably shouldn't happen. Um, but what we can agree on are some elements about what what should be in databases. What's sort of a a uh, uh, what's the goal uh, for for these databases, and some hope of if we want to try to mine one database versus another, that that we can have some communication between them. Great. Uh well, we, we have a, a couple of minutes left, and so I want to give uh, ask sort of a general question uh, to if you can quickly within a minute. <laughs> what 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 are some of the greatest uh, I guess achievements uh, or anything you'd like to talk about over these past few years uh, you'd like to point out, and then the future uh, very quickly. What do you, what are some of your thoughts as we move forward uh, in terms of international collaborations? Uh, what do you, uh, any thoughts there? And, and some of these uh, future, uh, how can we foster uh, future collaborations and uh, global uh, research? And Mark, you want to start? Mark, you want to sure. start? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think that um, and there was a question uh, here on how important is trust in building these international collaborations. And um, if there's one thing that has, that's been a, a huge accomplishment is the creation of this community uh, of a community that's that's working internationally in the area, and if there's one thing that uh, COVID has really uh, hurt us on is that it's it, it's threatening the um, the continuity of that community. Uh, it's it's face to face. It's personal. That's what collaboration is built on, and that's how trust is built. Um, that's how you know that you can co-author papers and share data. And uh, and not get scooped or you know all of the, all the various dynamics that come into uh, to these collaborations. So uh, yeah, I'm you know I, I look forward to the day uh, soon when uh, we'll be past this and we're going to be back to uh, the person to person. As great as you know doing something like this is, uh, it's not a, a full substitute. Thank you. And Anil, a couple of seconds. <laughs> Give us your yeah. <laughs> last minute 
So yes, I completely agree with Mark about the 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 dimension when we develop the trust when we have the face to face meetings and and we develop this network and friendships over the years and it just becomes that much more easier to have a dialogue. You may have from a regulatory standpoint, you may have differences uh, from regulators from U.S. and, and Europe and, and in Asia and, and elsewhere. Uh, but you can still have the dialogue uh, on science-based uh, uh, development. And so these uh, collaborations, the EU, U.S. EU communities of research, the global summits uh, through this APEC and then through these standards communities, uh, they enabled an excellent dialogue. And as Mark mentioned, they continued even during the pandemic when we couldn't have these face-to-face -face meetings. So they're, they're very beneficial, uh, beneficial and uh, you know, we should continue these activities uh, through, the, through the NNI. All right, well, thank you uh, both. Uh, we're unfortunately out of time, but to Nora, Mark, and Anil, thank you for sharing your perspectives. Uh, this has been an excellent uh, uh, webinar. I learned so much. Uh, and to our attendees, thank you for being a part of today's event. Uh, we hope that you will join us for future uh, webinars. And we invite you to follow uh, us on Twitter at uh, NNI Nano News, uh, and also to go to the nano.gov website. So again, uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you all so much for your attention uh, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you.